Have you ever been driving and passed a homeless person on the street and wondered what could I possibly do to help them? How could I help address this poverty? Today we're going to talk with author Brian Fickert, who's written a well-respected book on this, and how the church can respond to poverty in a helpful way. His answers might not be what you're expecting. Welcome to the Global Missions Podcast, a podcast for Christ followers who want to participate more effectively in God's work both at home and to the ends of the earth. Visit us at globalmissionspodcast.com to find show notes, resources, and previous episodes. Here's your host, Rob Magwood, better known to his friends as Mags. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us as we continue to discover how to participate in global missions more effectively. I'm your host, Mags, and today we'll be talking about poverty and how the church can respond. Our expert guest is Brian Fickert, the co-author of the best-selling book, When Helping Hurts, How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor or Yourself. But before we get to this expert interview, we'd like to share with you this mission resource. Do you have the Joshua Project app? Download this free app from the Google Play or Apple Store and start using it today. The Joshua Project app provides you with a daily summary of an unreached people group and how you can be praying for the work happening among them. Download the Joshua Project app and join the team in praying that God's kingdom would come to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And now, here's our interview with today's expert guest. Well, hello again, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you to today's podcast interview. Our guest is Dr. Brian Fickert, and uh, looking forward to chatting together, particularly about his book and how he can help us understand as Christ followers uh, engaging with poverty in a helpful way. I appreciate your patience this morning with my voice as I'm getting over a cold here. For those of you that haven't met Brian personally, he's the founder and president of the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College and is a professor of economics and community development. And he is the co-author of a very important book, a best-selling book, in fact, When Helping Hurts. The subtitle is How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor and Yourself. This is the first book in um, a few on this topic, all helpful, and we're looking forward to learning more about them today. Brian, welcome to this program. It's good to be with you today, Megs. Just before we get into the main topic, please just take a a couple of minutes and tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to be passionate about this topic and how the Lord has brought you to this point. Yeah, it's great to be with uh, the audience today. I felt called to work amongst the poor from a very young age. I I think it's partly the nature of the family I grew up in, my pastor's kid. Uh, But also, uh, God brought to my attention a book very early on in my life, uh, by Ron Sider, called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. And when I read that book, I became convinced that uh, part of being a follower of Jesus Christ is to have a concern for the poor, because Jesus had a profound concern for the poor. And, and as his followers, we're to have that concern as well. So for me, it's just been kind of a lifelong journey of trying to figure out how to use my gifts and my abilities and the opportunities that the Lord has provided to me to minister to the poor in the way that Jesus would. Uh, Ron's book, I remember engaging with it years ago. You have a newer book now, When Helping Hurts. We're just looking forward to unpacking it a bit with you. Some of our listeners may be familiar with it, but some, it may be entirely new to them. Could you just begin with a brief explanation of the main message? Sure. You know, uh, uh, almost, let's say, 20 years ago, I felt called to leave my position at the University of Maryland and to come to Covenant College, a small Christian liberal arts college on top of Lookout Mountain, Georgia. And it was kind of a crazy decision, but it was a decision that was rooted in a desire to work amongst the poor more effectively than I saw the secular world doing it, and quite frankly, more effectively than I saw the church doing it. But but the truth is, I didn't know what I was talking about. I, I, I had some passions, some desires, but really didn't know how to proceed and um, came to Covenant College and the Lord opened some doors for me here and and for us at the college and we were able to start this thing called the Chalmers Center, 
which is a church equipping organization. It's our hope that um, no poor people will ever hear of the Chalmers Center. Rather, we want the poor to experience the local church or, or by extension, the local missionary. And so the Bible says it is, that the body and bride and fullness of Jesus Christ. And so we were able to start the Chalmers Center, I guess, about 17 years ago. And early on, the Lord brought to me some really great people. Many of them are affiliated with Food for the Hungry. I know some of the folks in our, uh, in our audience, they may mm-hmm. have Food for the Hungry Canada. The Lord brought me some people uh, from Food for the Hungry, and um, uh, a conversation ensued. And the conversation was really about what is poverty really, and how can the local church address poverty more effectively. And, and so our book, When Helping Hurts, in, in some ways, is a diary of a of a ten year long conversation that I was able to be part of with our staff and some external folks, trying to really answer the question: How can the local church minister to the poor more effectively? And as the title suggests, when helping hurts, uh, the the idea here is that good intentions are not enough. It's actually possible to hurt the poor in the very process of trying to help them. Mm-hmm. And how important that is just to uh, begin with that affirmation, I think, in many cases, perhaps all cases, Christ followers are trying to help. They, As you said, they're intending to help, but inadvertently or unknowingly, they may not be helping as much as they want to. Yeah, you know, it used to be the case that the church was, the evangelical church was very involved in working with the poor. And then uh, about 100 years ago, the evangelical church kind of pulled away from that. There were concerns about um, what some would call the social gospel, concerns about just doing good apart from the verbal proclamation of the gospel. In, in, the, in the past 15 years or so, the evangelical church in uh, the United States and Canada and other places around the world, has kind of returned to its biblical mandate to con- be concerned for the poor, body and soul. But we're out of practice. We, we, we uh, have, have forgotten how to do some things, and we're often mimicking the mistakes of the secular world in how we work with the poor. And so our book is really trying to help the church to engage with some biblical principles and some best practices that are coming from the larger world so that we can be more effective in working amongst the poor. One of the things that's been challenging to me is the very definition of poverty. I wonder if you'd begin with that and just just spend a little, a little bit of time on how you actually define poverty. Yeah, you know, that that's really the, the most important question because the way that we diagnose the problem of poverty determines the solutions that we use to alleviate poverty. It's like when you go to the doctor. The first thing the doctor needs to do is to diagnose what's wrong with us. It's out of that diagnosis that the doctor uh, prescribes a treatment. And, you know, if the doctor gets the diagnosis wrong, if the doctor says, you know, you, you've got problem number one, you've really got problem number two, the doctor's going to give you the wrong kind of treatment and you won't get better. You might get worse. Right. And, and, and you know, similarly, the doctor can sometimes treat symptoms rather than underlying causes. You know, if you go to the doctor and you say, I've got a headache, the doctor gives you two aspirin, but you've really got a brain tumor, uh, you could die from that. And so treating symptoms rather than underlying causes can kill you. And and the same is true when we work with the poor. We've got to diagnose the causes of their poverty correctly. You know, it's interesting. If you ask most uh, Americans and, and probably most Canadians as well, uh, what is poverty? Well, we will often answer uh, the following. Poverty is about a lack of food, a lack of clothing, a lack of shelter, a lack of, of, of some material resource. We're materialistic people, and we tend to think of life in material terms. And so our solutions to helping the poor often lean towards providing material resources to people. And, and there can be a, there's a place for that, and there's a role for providing material resources. But that alone is not going to get to the root causes of poverty. So, in the end, then, how do you end up defining poverty then? Yeah, so uh, we really believe that we need to root our understanding of poverty in the biblical narrative that, that starts with creation, goes through the fall, and goes then into redemption, the final consummation of Christ's kingdom. And it comes back to this. What is a human being? Mm. The, the Bible teaches that human beings are image bearers. We bear the image of God Almighty. And so what we're really trying to do in poverty alleviation is restore people to image bearing. Well, what is that? Well, theologians have debated this for some time, but, but 
uh, I think a, a helpful way of thinking about it is this, that, that God is inherently a relational being. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost exist from all eternity in relationship with one another. And as image bearers, human beings are wired for relationship as well. We are to live in right relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the rest of creation. Four key relationships, God, self, others, and the rest of creation. So uh, human beings are highly integrated. We are, we're bodies and souls, highly integrated bodies and souls. But those bodies and souls don't live in a vacuum. Those bodies and souls are wired for proper relationship with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. And what the fall does is it distorts all four of those relationships for each human being. And it's out of the brokenness of those four key relationships that some people experience material poverty, a lack of food, a lack of housing, a lack of clean water. But, but that lack of material stuff is really a symptom of the deeper underlying brokenness in people's four key relationships. And so our book is arguing that we've got to stop treating the symptoms, the lack of material things, mm -hmm. and start getting down to deeper issues, people's broken relationships with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. And that frames everything about how you work with the poor. It has profound implications. They're very practical in nature for when that person comes into your church asking for help with uh, their electric bill or, or paying their rent. Mm -hmm. What you do in that moment flows out of your understanding of what poverty is. Wow, it's a foundational piece. It's helpful to me uh, as I continue to learn about this too. I probably myself would have migrated toward the previous definitions, the lack of material things, and how do we help with that? Uh, this roots it in a theological, biblical principle. Um, very, very helpful. So with that idea of poverty, how does this begin to fit together with the mandate of the church? Yeah, certainly uh, we believe that the church ought to be profoundly concerned about working with the poor. So, some people think the message of our book is stop trying to help poor people. And, and, and that's not the message at all. You know, uh, Jesus Christ comes declaring the good news of his kingdom. Luke chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus says he's come to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That is why he was sent. And the message of the kingdom is a message of comprehensive renewal. It's comprehensive shalom. It's that, it's that day we're all longing for in Revelation 21 when there is no more poverty. There is no more sickness. There are no more little girls being sold into brothels because all things have been made new. And Jesus' message is that he's ushering in that great day. Now, how does he communicate that message? He doesn't walk around with his hands in his pockets going, you know, I could heal the leper, I could heal the blind, I could heal the lame, uh, I have all power in heaven and earth, but I'm not going to really bother, just trust me. But nobody would have believed that. Nobody would have believed his message. And so Jesus authenticates his message through deeds, through deeds of mercy and compassion amongst the, the blind and the lame and the leper and the poor. And so Jesus is all about declaring his kingdom in words and in deeds amongst the poor. And he calls us as his body to, to be about the same thing. We continue Jesus' mission. So I believe the mission of the church is to declare the good news of the kingdom in words and in deeds, particularly amongst the poor. And so the message of our book isn't do less. The message of our book is do more. Do it differently than right. perhaps you have been recently. Now, some may say, well, Jesus was the Son of God, and obviously a very unique person, had capacity that we will not have, and yet you're saying, be like Jesus. How do you respond to the person that says, well, he was just so different, and he was on a particular mission, how can we possibly do what Jesus did? Well, that's a great question. Certainly, there's a difference between us and Jesus. Um, he's the Son of God, and we're not. He has all power in heaven and earth commissioned unto him, and we don't. But, but the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus works in and through the local church. You know, the book of Ephesians says that the church is the body and the bride, and indeed the very fullness, the word is used, the word fullness of Jesus Christ. And so we don't have his power and his strength on our own. But the book of Ephesians says that the same power 
that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated mm-hmm. him in the heavenly realms is at work in us. And so we have working in us uh, the power of Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, the power of the Holy Spirit as he fills us. And so we are his hands and his feet. Mm-hmm. When we encounter the local church, they're supposed to encounter Jesus Christ himself. And uh, oftentimes, of course, we're not able to do all the miracles that Jesus did, although I think it's okay to ask for such miracles. But, but Jesus has ordained in the local church the ministry of the Word, because he preached the good news of the kingdom, and the ministry of deeds and com- of compassion and mercy. We see that in Acts chapter 6 with the establishment of the diaconate, that Jesus wants his church to continue his mission of preaching his kingdom in words and in deeds amongst the poor. There's a wonderful balance, it seems to me, in that. There's a, the humility, of course, that no, we're not exactly like Jesus, and we can't do exactly what he was able to do. Mm-hmm. And yet we have been ennobled, if you will, to be his representatives That's it. and to as faithfully as possible uh, follow in his example and to, as you said, be his hands and uh, hands and feet. Before I ask you about some of the ways that we can really help, I wonder if you could just illustrate for us perhaps some of the ways that we've not been helping, either in the secular world and, and, and the movements to try and address poverty worldwide, or even through the church. What are some ways that we have been hurting? Yeah, you know, I, it's always difficult to answer that question because I, I don't want to paint with super broad strokes and... and um, kind of label various kinds of institutions as sure. all right or as all wrong. But, but let me just give you some examples. You, you know, um, again, I, I'm in the United States, and, and I don't know exactly what the this, this this situation is like in Canada, but in the United States anyway, most uh, evangelical Christians are, are often very critical of the federal government's welfare programs. We, we argue that, uh, oftentimes we argue that the federal government's welfare programs create dependencies. We, we we hand out money to people. We hand out food stamps to people. We actually create disincentives for people to work. We often create uh, disincentives for marriage. Oftentimes our government's efforts to help the poor actually undermine their dignity and create crippling dependencies uh, uh, within the poor. And, and, and I would argue it comes out of an understanding of what a human being is that's fundamentally flawed. It comes out to understand that human being is fundamentally material in nature, and because that being is fundamentally material in nature, they can be uh, made prosperous through material things alone. What's, what's so interesting to me is that so often the evangelical church mimics the mistakes of our federal government. Uh, we have soup kitchens that simply ladle out soup to people. We have food pantries and clothes closets that are simply handing out resources to people. We have short-term missions trips that go and dispense used clothing and, and, and used shoes. Uh, when we stop at a traffic light and there's a homeless person standing there, we put a quarter uh, in, that, uh, in that person's hand, knowing that all we're really doing is enabling them to stand out there the following day again once again asking for handouts. And so I would argue that all of this is reflective of a material understanding of poverty, a material understanding of what a human being is. And if we move towards a more relational understanding of a human being and of poverty, it suggests very different types of approaches that move away from simply providing material resources to trying to empower people to live as image bearers. Mm. Wow. Well, there's a great setup. Begin to take us there then. Uh, give us some ideas about what would be a, a healthier way to think about these things. Yeah, you know, I, there, there's a, a number of principles that come out in our book that I'll, I'll get into in a few minutes, but I, I want to start off with the most foundational principle, and that's this. You know, if poverty is rooted in broken relationships that each person has with God, self, others, and the rest of creation, th- then every one of us are poor, in the sense that none of us are experiencing these relationships in the way that God intended. Now, now as I say that, I want to be careful. There is something particularly profoundly difficult about being materially poor. And, 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 and the materially poor are, are often living in situations and leading lives that are suffocating, in which they have no choice and no options. And so I don't want to equate uh, uh, what they are going through with the way that I'm broken and the way that I experience brokenness. They're not the same thing. 
But I do want to emphasize that both Materially Poor and, and myself and those who are listening to this uh, podcast, that we are all broken. It just bubbles up in different ways in our respective lives. And the reason this is so important is this. One of the primary manifestations of brokenness in poor people around the world is a sense of shame. That broken relationship with themselves often expresses itself in a sense of inferiority, a sense of uh, an incapacity to make changes in their lives, a sense of hopelessness, a sense that they can't make a difference in their lives. And, and the way that that brokenness often occurs in the lives of those of us who are not materially poor is actually the opposite. We often have a sense of pride. Uh, we often have a sense of, of superiority. We often have a sense that, that we have um, somehow lived better lives. We've somehow uh, been more moral, perhaps even more spiritual. And that God has actually uniquely anointed us to bring our wisdom and our culture uh, and our understanding to save the materially poor around the world. And so that's a bad mix because when those of us who have a sense of pride interact with those who have a sense of shame and inferiority, we tend to confirm in the materially poor what they're already feeling, that they can't change their lives, that they are inferior, that they can't make a difference, that they need us to save them. And, and as they adopt that posture, uh, we get more frustrated with them. We, we, we tend to, to think that, yeah, I knew they were not as thrifty as I, I knew they were not as hardworking as I, I, I knew they weren't as industrious as I. And so their shame is enhanced and our pride is enhanced. And both parties are worse off at the end of the day. And so I can, I'm going to talk about some principles in a few minutes. But, but the most important thing is really this, that, that, that the number one step, the primary prerequisite to working successfully with materially poor is actually repentance. And, and the repentance I'm talking about is our repentance, our repentance of our pride, our repentance of our materialism, our repentance of our, our, our sense that we have been uniquely anointed to solve the problems of the poor. And, and the adoption of a different posture, it's a gospel posture, which says that I was once an enemy of the cross, that I was once dead in my transgressions and sins, <laughs> that, 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 that I bring nothing to the table, and that God, out of his grace and mercy, has redeemed me. And, and he starts to give me a new aroma, the Bible says, a better smell. The problem is I often start to think that better aroma, that, that better smell, comes from myself. And so the, the, I've got to be reminded every day that there but for the grace of God go I. And, and that I am just like that materially poor person. And if I ever forget that, my posture towards them will always be a posture of superiority. And that posture crushes the materially poor. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, Lord, thank you for your mercy toward us when we've had a wrong posture, when we've had wrong attitudes. Yeah, you know, mix it. And, and the problem is that pride, when mm. you mix it in with the material understanding of poverty, mm. it's that the two feet off of each other. Because if you start off saying that poverty is fundamentally about a lack of material resources, well, th then I'm the solution for the poor because right. I've got the material resources. And, and I, I've been successful. I've won the game of life. And not only have I been successful and that I'm not poor, I've got what they need. It's sitting in my wallet. And so it necessarily puts me in a position of superiority and necessarily puts them in a position of inferiority. And the entire dynamic starts off on the wrong footing with me being their savior and then having to hold out their hands and waiting for me to save them. And it just takes us down the path that we've got to get out of, a path of our pride and a path of their inferiority. Mm -hmm. so, so the first message is really embrace the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's got to be something that's drilled home in our churches. It's got to be uh, something that's proclaimed from our pulpits and in our Sunday school classes and our small groups and our short-term missions trips and um, our youth groups. It, it's got to be something that our churches are just dripping with. And it, it's been the case in my life that working amongst the poor has helped me discover the gospel. I mean, I kind of I already knew it, but it's helped me to be uh, reminded in a fresh way. And so I would love it if those who are listening to this podcast today didn't think of work amongst the poor is kind of an isolated, um, kind of icing on the cake thing for their churches, but as actually as central to the task of their churches and as a central forum 
in which they can disciple the members of their congregation in the truths of the gospel. Well, then some of these principles that emerge out of this foundation then, Brian, give us, give us some ideas about where you've seen fruitful, healthy engagement. Yeah, terrific. So uh, out of this foundational understanding of poverty as being rooted in broken relationships and of poverty be alleviation being about restoring people to proper relationship, we, we draw out three key principles. The first is it's very important to distinguish between relief and rehabilitation and development. You, you know, not all poverty is the same. It often looks the same on the surface, but the underlying causes of poverty are very different. Think, think about uh, the people in Nepal in the first minutes after the uh, earthquake. earthquake. When you think about those people there, they're lacking adequate food and clothing and shelter. But now think of the homeless person staying on the street corner in any of our uh, large cities. That person's also lacking adequate food and clothing and shelter. And yet the underlying conditions are very different for these two people. The, the one, the folks in Nepal are experiencing a disaster and they are uh, unable to help themselves. And so in that kind of response, in that kind of situation, relief is the appropriate intervention. Re relief is a handout. Relief is when you do things for people because they can't do those things for themselves. And it's the appropriate response to a crisis in which the person or the community or the country is unable to help themselves. But once the bleeding has stopped, once the person or the village or the community or the country are no longer incapacitated, we then should move into rehabilitation, which is about restoring people to the pre-crisis conditions. That's a different dynamic than relief. In relief, you're doing things to people or for people. In rehabilitation, you're doing things with people. You're saying to the people in Nepal, hey, why don't you work with us to rebuild your country? Why don't you bring your gifts and your resources and your effort to the table? And we'll come alongside of you. And, 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 and the, the reason for that posture is not because we don't love them. It's because we do. The, the goal isn't stuff. The goal is restoration to image bearing. Part of being in right relationship to creation is to be a steward of one's gifts, to be a steward of one's community, to use uh, one's gifts to affect change in the world around us. And so part of this posture of being restored to a proper relationship to creation is asking people to contribute something to their own improvement. And then finally, development is, is walking with the, uh, the, the, the people in Nepal or, or with that homeless person uh, to help them achieve greater levels of, of humanness, greater levels of image bearing than they have ever experienced before. And that's really the hardest task because you're trying to walk with people into higher levels of human flourishing than they've ever experienced before. It's uncharted territory for them. But the truth of the matter is, most poor people around the world and in our communities don't need relief. They need development. They're not in a crisis. They're in a chronic state of poverty. It's profoundly important to address their poverty. But we've got to do it in a developmental way, a way that asks them to use their gifts and their abilities to really take ownership of their own change process. Mm -hmm. And we come alongside of them in that process and encourage them along the way. But that's different from ladling soup out of a bowl or, or dispensing used clothing. It's a different kind of dynamic. Right. What I hear you saying is it, um, those efforts might be the correct solution for a certain context, but often we apply the correct solution, solution in the wrong context. That's exactly right. And it's the same, it has the same effect of the doctor treating the wrong disease. Hmm. It, it doesn't help you. It can actually make things worse for you. And we actually think that this is the primary problem that most churches face in their work with the poor, both at home and abroad, is that we're pr applying relief in contexts where the people are not helpless, where people are not incapacitated, where the people actually need a developmental approach. And if you do relief in a context where development is the right approach, it can do real harm. It can undermine dignity. It can undermine human flourishing. It can undermine the sustainability of the intervention. It's a profoundly uh, uh, terrible mistake. Fascinating. I'll let you press on. Well, th so the first thing is distinguishing between relief and rehab and development. The second principle is uh, using an asset-based as opposed to a needs-based approach to working with the poor. You know, most of us, if we were going to start a ministry amongst the poor, we would uh, often start off with a needs assessment. We'd mm -hmm. go out and try to identify 
what's wrong with the community. Or, or perhaps when that woman walks into your church asking for help with her electric bill or with paying her rent or with gas money, our first inclination is to start off with what's wrong, what are her needs. But you know, if you start off with a needs-based approach, we're just falling into the very dynamic we've got to get out of, that, that, that God complex superiority on our part and that sense of inferiority and shame and marred identity on their part. And, and, and the, whole, the whole communication is that I'm okay and you're not okay and I am the solution to your problems. And it, it starts the entire dynamic off on the wrong footing. And so we advocate, as many do, this certainly is not unique to us, an asset-based approach, which starts off with what's right, which asks uh, the uh, low-income individual or the low-income community, what gifts and abilities and resources do you have? How can you use those gifts and those resources and those abilities to accomplish your goals? How can we come alongside of you to complement you? Sometimes that will mean providing some material resources to the person, but, but it's done in such a way that complements their use of their gifts and their abilities rather than undermining the use of those gifts and those abilities. And, and, and um, you know, this can, can kind of degenerate into an I'm okay, you're okay kind of postmodern gobbledygook, but, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, we think it's actually rooted in the biblical narrative. That the Bible doesn't start with Genesis chapter 3, the fall. It starts with Genesis chapter 1, the creation. And so we think we should start that way in our storyline with low-income people and, and low-income communities. What's good here? What's right here? What's the goodness that God has placed here? How has the fall distorted that? And how can we apply Christ's redemption to that to restore the individual or community to what God has created them to be? So it's, it, it's an asset-based approach. It starts off with what's right. The key task in an asset-based approach is, is, is not to figure out what's wrong. It's to figure out what's right. What, mm -hmm. what, what are the gifts and abilities there? How can we identify those gifts and those abilities? How can we mobilize those assets? How can we um, connect those to other assets? It's a different kind of approach from simply providing uh, things to address needs. I think for me personally, this was one of the biggest aha moments, perhaps other than the definition of poverty, uh, that starting point. And one of the gals on our staff, Rebecca, has helped me with this in looking at asset surveys of where our teams are working, where our short-term workers will go, and understanding what is the positive there rather than just arriving and trying to, to fix it. Um, there's, there's more listening involved at the front. There's more learning involved. It's a, it's a, uh, a position that has more humility from our point of view, and then it leads to other outcomes as well. Yeah, it, it's really it, it's a, a dramatic shift in how we approach things, but it's profoundly powerful. You know, you know, there's actually two editions of our book. The first edition came out in 2009, and a number of people said to us, uh, we understand your critique. We don't really understand what you're suggesting is the way forward. And, and one possibility is that we didn't write it very clearly. <laughs> Another possibility is that um, our readers, like, like we as authors, are often so materialistic in our understanding of what a human being is that, that the process of discovering assets sounds like it's not doing anything. So we wrote a second edition of our book that came out in 2012 with a whole uh, uh, part four that kind of lays out the process and plan a little bit more clearly. But it starts off with just asking people, what are your gifts and what are your abilities? And, and that may sound like it's not doing anything, but when you're talking to a person who because of their gender or the color of their skin or their tribe or perhaps the, 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 where they've been born, because of those things they've been told and their ancestors have been perhaps told for hundreds of years that you are the scum of the earth, you are less than human, you'll never make anything of yourself, there is no hope for you. When you are part of multiple generations that have received that message and somebody comes to you and says, what gifts and abilities do you have? That question, just asking that question can unleash possibilities and latent potential that's residing in that person because they were created as an image bearer. And so it's a very powerful thing to do, but it's not a material thing to do. And so it confuses us. This is such a helpful transition in a starting point, uh, having this audit of positive potential. Brian, I wonder if you could help us turn towards short-term missions 
As our listeners think about participating in short-term missions or people from their churches, there will be many, uh, considering that even this summer in 2016, what advice would you have for them as they think about sending out short-term missional workers, whether it's into their own community or, or uh, somewhere further away across the world? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, first of all, I want to start off saying that I, I do believe that short-term trips uh, can be powerful experiences, uh, both for those who go and for those on the receiving end. Uh, all three of my children have been on short-term trips, and all three of them, when they met with the uh, elders of our church to be examined to become um, to make a public profession of their faith, years apart, all three of my children were asked the question, uh, uh, name, point to a significant spiritual experience in your own life. And all three of my kids, years apart, have said, uh, our, the time that we spent in Africa as a family was the most significant spiritual experience of my life. God felt more real to us on that experience, on that trip, than he ever has before. Wow. So I want, I want our listeners to hear that I believe in the power of, of, of short-term trips. But I, I also uh, want to provide some caution. Uh, if we think that poverty is fundamentally rooted in broken relationships— that means that in the space of a one or two week trip, we cannot alleviate poverty. Relationships cannot be restored with God's self, others, and the rest of creation. Relationships have been broken sometimes due to very complex causes spanning even centuries. Mm -hmm. Those relationships cannot be restored in the space of a one or two week trip. We cannot alleviate poverty on a short term missions trip, but we can sure make it worse. Because if we go and hurl around resources, if we go in and take over, if we go in and take charge of things, we communicate to people that they are inferior, that we are superior, and that they need our resources to save them. And it's important to remember that our trip is often only one of sometimes dozens of trips that are going to the same communities year in and year out. And when wave after wave of short-term teams goes in and, and hurls around resources and takes over uh, local mysteries and local cities, sometimes for one or two weeks at a time, it does real harm. It exacerbates the problem of poverty. And so we've got to, the first step in our short-term missions trips is to completely reframe what on earth they're about. They're not about alleviating poverty. Uh, we believe they can be uh, reframed as, as vision trips or as cross-cultural learning experiences but we've got to move away from grandiose language about how we're going to alleviate poverty or advance global missions and move it more towards language that's more moderate in tone about cross-cultural learning, mm -hmm. about fellowship, about encouraging people who are there. It's a different posture. It's a, they can be profoundly important experiences, but we have to reframe what they're all about on the front end. And there's more we can talk about if you'd like to. The first piece is reframe what they're about. Brian and I didn't visit on this before the, the podcast, but you have articulated much of our philosophy at SEND as well as far as the value of short-term missions. We want to honor it. There is great value in it for certain things. Mm -hmm. However, we don't want to overstate what the value is. And um, this is just a helpful, a helpful piece in redefining what the desired outcomes are for a very potential uh, event sometimes with young people and there are many young people of course participating in this and I appreciate your uh, clear statements that sometimes we're making it worse and so that gives us a caution by which we say boy we need to think very carefully about this and uh, certainly we want to try and provide the resources um, to do that I know that in this book uh, in your main book um, Brian you cover some of these ideas. I know that you've also got a, a second book, Helping Without Hurting in Short-Term Missions. Would you just uh, talk about the relationship between those two? Should, should a church leader who's hearing this read the main book first, or could they go directly to the short-term missions book if they were uh, planning a short-term trip? <laughs> well, I have an incentive to say they have to read everything. That's right. Read the, <laughs> buy them all, right? <laughs> I get that. 
um, so that the truth of the matter is one could pick up the short term missions book and run with that alone. We, we think that it would be a mistake to do that. The leader probably needs to go deeper. Mm. And, and so we would suggest that the leader read when helping hurts to understand, again, some of the core ideas of what poverty is, what poverty alleviation really looks like and what it doesn't look like. And then with that, building upon that background, they'd be able to jump in more effectively into Help Without Hurting and Short Term Missions, which has a leader's guide, participant's guide, and then a series of videos to help the leader to lead uh, their team through a process of learning for more effective long-term engagement. What an excellent help that will be. One of my takeaways from our uh, discussion today is to look at those and see how our teams for 2016 – uh, can benefit from this and hopefully get a uh, more healthy trajectory in some of those cases. And if you are thinking uh, about doing a short-term mission or you will participate in short-term missions in 2016, we want to remind you that we've taken the show notes while we've been talking with Brian here and you can just visit the website. So all of the core ideas that we've been talking about are there as well as uh, links um, and I'll ask you that in just a minute, Brian, if there are particular websites that you would encourage uh, listeners to go and have a look. Yeah, certainly. We'd love it if folks went to the website of the Chalmers Center because there you can find uh, all kinds of resources, including references on how to purchase when helping hurts uh, and uh, the related products of helping hurting short term missions when helping hurts the small group experience, um, helping hurting church benevolence from the Penn State Dignity, a whole series of books and resources that are coming out, including uh, many videos that one can use as part of these studies to help disciple our congregations for more effective ministry at home and abroad. If you would, just uh, the small group experience, describe what is that? Is that for a, uh, a life group or a small group study group uh, in a church? Yeah, what many, what many churches have said to us is, we love when helping hurts. How can you help us disciple all of our members? And and. I said, well, how many people would you have in your church? And they said, 5,000. I said, buy 5,000 copies of When Helping Hurts. And they said, well, nobody's going to read that. We, we need something that's, that's just for small groups and for Sunday school classes. And so we created When Helping Hurts, the small group experience, uh, which is, I think, about six lessons and six videos that go along with it. The videos are uh, available off of our website. And so it's meant to enable a small group leader to, to walk into a typical small group, ask a couple of opening questions to start conversation, pop in the video that's usually about 12 minutes long, and then some uh, additional follow-up questions for further discussion and then some content to go deeper if they want to. So it's meant as a tool to help disciple the entire congregation in the core principles we're talking about. Brian, um if our listeners would like to learn more from what you've been writing together with Steve uh, about the Chalmers Center, you've mentioned the website there. How can they, how can they find you and, and follow you? Yeah, our website does update people about upcoming events. We do Helping Without Hurting seminars. We've done three or four in Canada in conjunction with Food for the Hungry Canada. And I believe uh, Send was a co-host on one of them. As we were, yes. Thinking. Yeah. So we are doing seminars and workshops um, across North America. If you just go to our website, you'll see announcements about upcoming events. There's also, again, uh, uh, ongoing release of new books and training materials and training processes. Uh, we have something called Faith and Finances, which is helping to equip churches to provide financial education for very poor people. Uh, work Life, helping churches to help people get off of uh, uh, public assistance and into the workforce. Um, internationally, we have microfinance materials, and so there's all kinds of resources there that you can download or purchase. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, um, seminars that we're doing across North America. Well, I want to say a big thank you to you, uh, Brian. I know that in some ways we've just scratched the surface, and there's some careful thinking to be done, but it's been a great introduction to some important ideas that I trust will be an encouragement and helpful to our listeners. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Thanks. It's great to be with you, and I hope that God will use this little podcast to equip uh, His church for more effective service in home and abroad. We hope you found today's interview to be both informative and inspiring. If you missed anything or would like to check out the resources or links mentioned during the interview, you can find the show notes we've prepared at our website, globalmissionspodcast.com. 
You can also use the website or our Facebook page to suggest a particular topic or expert you'd like to hear featured on this program. The Global Missions Podcast is co-sponsored by the Jaffrey Centre for Global Initiatives and SEND International of Canada. Thanks for listening in. I'm your host, Mags, and I invite you to join us again in two weeks when we'll continue to explore this grand adventure of being Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth.